title of this next talk is very purposeful in that one of the beautiful things about what we do is we can't expect what's coming in. And a day could be simple and easy, but then you can also get a litany of incredibly complicated college ambassador diseases, autoimmune blistering diseases, you name it. And so using cases that I've seen, I'm gonna to try to guide you of like how to stay calm and cool, like from the talk yesterday, but also how to approach these patients and treat them in an algorithmic manner. Uh, I have absolutely no conflicts regarding this. But I will say, it'd be nice if you started to have conflicts because we need drugs actually indicated for diseases in the world of dermatology, for lupus, dermatomyositis, sarcoidosis, uh, scleroderma, and I hope they will be coming soon. So I feel like we probably do one of these when our MA comes in and says, oh, so patient with history of systemic lupus, rash all over the body uh, on just hydroxychloroquine. And we're like, oh God, like I'm gonna be here a while. Um, so I'm hopeful that this approach to thinking about these patients will make that a little bit easier. You don't wanna hide in the Mandalorian's knapsack. So case one, 49 year old man with rash on scalp and chest for two years. That's really descript. So here we can see multiple, kind of atrophic, brown, well-demarcated plaques on the chest and abdomen. Okay, a little more meat in the scalp. We see this very violaceous purple, and actually hues of purple, well-defined uh, scarring plaque, and especially on a hair area that's important. So there's a scarring alopecia within this active plaque. We see some involvement in the conchal bowl. And of course, you don't want to do a biopsy. Though I will say what's interesting with certain forms of connective tissue disease, for example, lupus versus dermatomyositis, you really can't tell the difference on histology. You're gonna see the same interface dermatitis, paranexal involvement, mucin deposition, but for subtypes of cutaneous lupus, you should be able to make that delineation. Like here, we are seeing this atrophy, interface dermatitis, mucin deposition, and so this is discoid lupus. Uh, the incidence of cutaneous lupus is actually greater than that of systemic lupus, which I guess is a good thing. Um, and DLE, which is a chronic cutaneous lupus, makes up uh, more than half of all cases we're gonna see. Um, more frequent in women than men, and possibly higher in certain demographics, like those who, refer, who identify as, uh, as black. Now, you can see this in just skin alone. And I think that's where it gets a little confusing because we see cutaneous lupus. Like, oh, this is a herald of systemic lupus. But there are many patients who just have skin disease. Doesn't mean it's any less disabling, but I think it's important to realize that the majority of cases are predominantly going to be in skin. We historically talked about that zero conversion rate. So it's 10 to 12 percent. Some studies say up to 20 percent will progress. And I'll talk about how to think about that in your monitoring in a bit. Um, there is some data showing that cutaneous lupus is more disabling than SLE, which is nuts because SLE can kill you. Um, but that kind of goes back to the burden of skin disease. The visibility of it, the tactile nature of it, the paritis, the pain, even considering a, a life-threatening disease, patients think this is absolutely worse. And from these photos, I think it's clear. Now, it doesn't always walk in the door and slap you in the face, or in my case, the neck. Um, it may be subtle, but you're starting to already see a scarring alopecia here, and so this is when you want to intervene quickly, because time is hair. Once a scalp scars, you're not getting those hairs back. Even less subtle, in the jawline, a faint pink to almost off-white scarring allopatic patch or plaque uh, along the jawline. And here, not so subtle, but what you really should not necessarily miss is that DLE can degenerate to SCC. And so we've biased this guy a ton of times, fortunately no SCC, but I have found SCC arising in DLE plaques in the past. So certainly something to consider, especially in line with what you just heard. If you think something is X and you treat it as X and it doesn't get better, you might need to revisit the diagnosis. All right, so let's get into the real meat of it, treatment. Um, so for all cutaneous lupus patients, you're gonna talk about photoprotection. Smoking is a no-no. First of all, smoking is bad in general, increases the risk of squamous cell carcinoma in these patients. It also can interfere with the first-line therapy, which is a hydroxychloroquine. You're going to hit them hard with class 1 steroids, interlesional steroids, uh, to the kind of thick plaques, you know, a broad range. Um, and I will say, on the scalp or in hair bearing areas, I tend to go higher because I'm trying to prevent the loss of that follicular ostea. 
for moderate severe disease, you know, depending on how bad they are when they come in, they're gonna get a nice protracted taper of prednisone, usually one mg per kg, but depending on the case, maybe a half a mg per kg, and we'll do that over maybe a month or two. And at that moment, I'm initiating hydroxychloroquine. It is a great go-to. It takes a long time to work. I'm talking like four or five months before it works. So if you're even thinking about it, put it in the water because it's gonna be a while before they see a difference. Um, quinacrin is certainly uh, another option, um, which is sometimes difficult to get. You might have to have it compounded, um, and, and you can uh, actually combine with hydroxychloroquine. Um, uh, chloroquine, however, you do not want to do in combination with hydroxychloroquine. That will increase the ocular toxicity. Now, for more resistant disease, all these but goodies, higher prednisone. Uh, I mentioned I like mycophenolate. Uh, Methotrexate is also a commonly studied one. Uh, dapsone, I may even start a little earlier. You know, dapsone and hydroxychloroquine, I kind of put on the same playing, playing field, but I usually lead in with hydroxychloroquine because you don't need lab monitoring. Um, I really liked the title of this paper, even though it's not in, in dermal literature, why all patients, these patients should be on hydroxychloroquine. I agree. I mean, there's so much benefit, really low level uh, risk when thinking about this chronic treatment. There's some great guidance out there. Tony Fernandez from, uh, from the Cleveland Clinic uh, has really spent a lot of time to demystify this, make it as simple as humanly possible. This was a really nice paper he put out. So you heard before the less than or equal to five mg per kg body weight that Dr. Cohen mentioned. If you look in the literature, it says six and a half, but that's ideal body weight. Is anyone here their ideal body weight? That would be amazing. So really go with the lower dose to assure that you are not gonna go into the ocular toxic realm. And so that's gonna be at most 400 a day. We really don't go higher than that unless the patients are really morbidly obese. And even then I'd probably hesitate. Uh, long half-life, you can alternate day dosing if they have side effects like GI side effects. So a lot of flexibility. You do not need to check G6PD. Yes for Dapsone, not for this. Can take a couple months. GI toxicity is the big one, but we need to know about the ocular disease. The way I do it based on the guidance is within that first year, screening baseline. If they're on the drug at the dose is appropriate, you do not need to check up until five years, but if they're on along in the five years, it goes to every year there, uh, thereafter. Because uh, the risk of, of eye damage permanent, like central scotoma, is like three to 4% in a 15 year time period. So not too onerous, but certainly not educate patients on this. Uh, mycophenolate, I, as I said, I, I like, I, I've used it, I used it a lot more in the past. Uh, certain diseases don't really require it anymore, but I certainly use it here. I start 500 twice a day after, I don't think this dose will probably work, and it does take time for this drug to work, but it's more of a tester dose. Within two to three weeks, I'm gonna bump them up to 1,000 milligrams twice a day after lab testing, and then I'll keep them there and see how that works. And then I'll go up, go down. The max dose is 1,500 twice a day, so 1.5 grams twice a day. Biggest side effects, GI upset, uh, though urinary frequency is listed as the most common one. Um, and also, you, you, for certain patients, you do need to uh, screen for um, uh, cervical HPV um, because there is concern for malignant conversion. Methotrex, they also oldie but goodie. Um, I imagine most here know how to use it. I've been shown how to use it. Beginning, it's been around literally forever. Um, there is some evidence showing that it can work. Um, don't forget the folic acid supplementation to prevent dropping of the CBC. Uh, but certainly something that's easy because it's once a week. We, it's the poison we know, we know what to expect with it. Um, there are some new drugs out there in the world of SLE, so not available to us, but this is an opportunity for really severe patients or calcitonin patients to get room involved because they can set these patients up in, a, uh, in an infusion center. Uh, and this actually, even though it's not for skin, had really nice skin findings. On the horizon, medical cannabinoids, uh, and in fact, lupus may be the first described disease of endocannabinoid, meaning in our bodies, dysfunction. That the enzyme that breaks down cannabinoids is too active, it's too hungry, like we've seen in other diseases, like atopic derm and psoriasis with PD4. So it's not such a far cry from what we're already used to when it comes to these diseases. So we're actually looking at this currently, so I just thought I'd pivot a little bit, talk about some up and coming cool translational science using this animal model of lupus, where they get systemic lupus and also skin disease that mirrors DLE. We're able to show that topical anandamide, which is an endocannabinoid you're all making right now, that if you supplement it, you can actually prevent the development of these plaques. 
What about this? So you, you calm it down, you clear it out. They're stuck with extraordinary disfigurement, dyschromia. I do employ a lot of the cosmetic camouflages, and I don't have conflict of interest with either of these, but these are two that are readily available and I think are actually very effective. What about this one? This patient, really significant skin disease. All of a sudden, she goes from a ANA 140, which is not even the cutoff anymore. A lot have gone up to 1 to 80, to 1 to 320, which is legit. I would argue most cases, a 1 to 80 is not really enough to hang your hat on. You really need a higher dilution to say that this is truly associated with an autoimmune disease. So to that point, I usually draw the line at 1 to 160. Anything less than that, like a 1 to 80 or a 1 to 40, it could be because of pregnancy, old age. There's so many things that can cause a positive ANA, even though I don't consider it positive. And so yeah, this guy is ANA loving it, but he doesn't have lupus. So lots of things can give you a positive ANA. Um, all right, into case two. So this is a, a, a patient comes in, two year history of a rash on the upper arm, also says there's some trouble breathing. You see this well demarcated dermal, white, almost pinkish plaque on the upper arm. You can see where I did my biopsy. And here's the histology, these naked granulomas consistent with sarcoidosis. So stats more common in women, um, also possibly more common in those who identify as black, um, and also the severity and fatality is also higher in those who identify as black. And there's a patient I showed the other day who was like, I don't know what I'll advise. He had significant skin disease, and he had no doctors monitoring his sarcoidosis. Unacceptable. I think that this is the great mimicker. Syphilis, goodbye. This could do almost anything. So many different morphologies, primary lesions, secondary lesions. It can show up in the weirdest places, like tattoo, in Botox injection sites, in, in, in zoster, or former zoster sites, you name it. It can go wherever it wants. How do we hit them? We hit them hard. Ultra-prone topical steroids, oral corticosteroids, if they have significant disease, and we're gonna taper them over two to three months while we get other things on board. Now what's nice is there's nice evidence supporting hydroxychloroquine and tetracycline antibiotics, and depending on severity, I may start both at exactly the same time. And there's more evidence with uh, minocycline than doxycycline. But it's also the other ones, methotrexate. Um, there is some evidence for biologics like TNF inhibitors. The problem is that for every case that it works, there are cases that show it makes it worse. So you gotta tread lightly, I think. So I include this, this should be in the handout in terms of the algorithm that I follow, uh, usually, though I could certainly shoot from the hip sometimes, in terms of how do you quickly build up. It's not about lateralizing, it's adding on and on and on until you get disease control. All right, case number three. Nine-year-old woman, a female with progressively enlarging rash on the right lower extremity for a year. So here we see this relatively disfiguring, atrophic, bound down, centrally hypopigmented, peripherally hyperpigmented plaques, kind of following a pattern, right? Like, that's something to also think about, not just what your primary, secondary lesions are, where is it? Where's it going? It's kind of following almost like a curvy or linear fashion down, down this patient's leg. Look a little closer, some eroded areas, dyschromia. And so just from the, from even the far back of the room, you can see there's something weird about this biopsy. It's a nice hunking square. And so there's a limited differential for square biopsy, and these are gonna be sclerosing or fibrotic processes. And so this is morphia, specifically linear morphia. Most common in type, subtype in children. And that's really important because this, if left unchecked, can not only be disfiguring, but limit development and mobility because it can go deep. It can be profunda, it can go to fascia, and it can really, once again, if it's over a joint, that joint could be uh, permanently uh, affected. There are some variants like in Kudasab, which is what you're seeing in the middle, which is a split down the middle of the forehead. Um, it is important to identify that, as well as Peri-Romberg, which affects this portion of the face because they can involve underlying cranial nerves, can be associated with seizures. So you do want to define those specific subtypes if that's present. Metastosis can be, a, it can be found with a linear morphia, which literally translates to melting wax. And you can see on this foot, the bone changes look like a, a candle with melting wax down the side. Um, initially, maybe totally harmless appearing. And I've had cases of patients come in and say, listen, you're the third person I've come to. People think I'm crazy. There's something right here, I swear. And they're telling me there's nothing there whatsoever. And so I'll look, and they're just looking at me like, 
pleading, you know, like the doe eyes, like, please tell me there's something there. And I'll say, okay, lift your eyebrows, bring them down, lift them up. And so what I'll see is the line goes across, poof, disappears, goes across. That lack of rightids is an early sign of sclerosing diseases. So this patient had super duper early in Kudasab, but no one could see it, no one acknowledged it. Biopsy proved it, got her on therapy. It's so great to catch it early, like in this case, where you're already seeing some disfigurement of the nose because it can really be disfiguring but also can limit uh, functionality. Treatments, not great levels of evidence. And interestingly enough, uh, calcifotrien has really good evidence for some reason, so I do employ that. I often use the combined betamethasone, calcifotrien, and then as we go on with treatment, I want to limit steroid use. I'll, I'll, I'll do calcifotrien during the week, maybe steroids on the weekend, or maybe I'll include it with a calcineurin inhibitor, which also has some evidence. Light therapy, we typically think about UVA, which is not readily available. You need a special room for that. However, there is evidence that, um, that UVB, narrowband UVB, is somewhat analogous to like moderate potency UVA. So you can use UVB in these patients. Um, topical therapy, as I mentioned, topical steroids, calcium neurodehibitors in between to keep slamming them with anti-inflammatory activity. And there is evidence to support that. As I mentioned, this is what I do. Combo, either separated or if I can get it covered together. Tacrolimus also. And the nice thing about calcimetrine, tacrolimus, you can keep the party going. You do not have to stop. Um, so, you know, hit and repeat. Um, I mentioned UVA1, UVB, both are effective. UVB is going to be much more accessible. And I have treated patients with generalized morphia with narrowband, and it can be helpful. Um, just of note, UVB, UVA will help with the tightness the appearance will not change. They will still have dark atrophic areas. Make sure to give them that expectation. It's not gonna make it magically disappear. It's gonna soften it. Um, hydroxychloroquine, also evidence. You can use it here. It's like, once again, throw it in the water. Why don't you? So I do start these patients in addition to other things on hydroxychloroquine. I had one patient with horrific linear morphia of his left leg, and he got high dose prednisone, mycophenolate, hydroxychloroquine, day one. There's no reason to, to kind of stagger. Get those on board quickly. Methotrexate also, lots of evidence, especially in kids, which is nice because this does affect the kiddos, and so we need to have options that we know are safe in this patient age range. Um, just another example of uh, treatment with uh, uh, methotrexate resistance. So it doesn't work for everyone, uh, and I do, as I mentioned, use a lot of mycophenolate here. So just to give you another flow chart in terms of how to think about it, I think part one for getting in treatment, where is it? Is it forehead? Is it on the nose? Is it overlying an extensor area? Is it over a joint? When I see it over a joint, in addition to all of the things I'm gonna give them, they're going to PT early, because that can help. I had a patient who had really impressive, it was like dark purple morphia going here, coming down along her elbow. Like we did high dose prednisone, methotrexate, and she was in PT the next week doing all those fun, crazy exercises, whatever the hell they do. Because um, I did not, even with treatment, did not want this to lead to any type of disability, especially involving the arm. So that's really important to think about that. Just like you add everything on at first, definitely think about PT. Um, you can think about phototherapy if it's accessible, um, but for more severe, moderate severe disease, you're gonna be giving them something systemic and possibly multiple things. The beauty of prednisone here is that for everything I mentioned, it works. It's a short-term fix, but it works and it buys you time. Actually, for, for some of those subtypes of morphia like Perry Romberg, the recommendation uh, in some of the textbooks is like a three to four month taper of prednisone as you're revving up methotrexate, which in, in that textbook, especially Bologna, is a treatment of choice. So this is not 40 milligrams tapered, 40, 20, 10, five in a week. This is very protracted, so it means you also have to think about vitamin D and calcium, you have to think about reflux, but this is gonna be a long course of prednisone while everything is getting on board, especially uh, for, for morphia and, and localized scleroderma, which can be utterly disastrous. So with that, and 37 seconds left, thank you for your attention.